Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and today our guest is Professor Paul Sabin. An assistant professor of environmental history, Professor Sabin's research and teaching focus on U.S. environmental history, energy politics, and political and economic history, including natural resource development in the American West and overseas. His book, Crude Politics, examines how politics and law shaped a growing dependence on petroleum in California and the nation. Today, we'll talk with Professor Sabin about how history can prepare us for the climate crisis and energy transition. Welcome, Professor Sabin. Thank you, Marilyn. It's a pleasure to be here. In your latest essay, you argue that historians can help us prepare for the climate and energy crises. Give us your perspective. Sure. Well, in the, my, my most recent work, I'm really trying to figure out what uh, role historians might have to play in addressing the climate problem and also the energy issues. And I, and I come at it from the perspective that uh, we've been aware of the climate problem for many years uh, since the, there's a, uh, the Jules Charney's report in 1979. Uh, so really the last three decades, we've really been aware of the broad scope of the climate problem, but we haven't been able to solve, solve the problem. And so in my recent work, I'm ar I argue that uh, one of the reasons that this is the case is that the problem has been addressed primarily by uh, lawyers and scientists and engineers and economists, and really that the energy problem, its nature, is one that is, uh, is not actually a technical problem. It's a social problem. And historians have a lot to offer uh, in thinking about climate and energy in that context. And uh, so in the essay, I'm exploring some of the uh, insights that history might bring to bear to, uh, to the climate problem and energy issues. Okay, so what are some of the lessons that historians can offer us? Well, I think the, the first lesson is that, <clears throat> is that uh, history really is embedded in, in a lot of the conversations around climate change and uh, uh, in, in that, that, that as people try to develop solutions to these problems, they're, they're using history. Uh, yet at the same time, historians haven't been involved in the conversation. So some of the examples might be uh, for instance, right now there's a current debate in, in Congress about whether to uh, pursue a cap and trade bill for, for uh, carbon dioxide emissions, which would uh, set an overall cap for, uh, for these emissions and then allow industries and businesses to trade those underneath those cap. That, so that's one idea. And then the other is to pursue a tax that would uh, uh, raise the price of carbon, uh, carbon emissions. And I think that the, this debate has been profoundly influenced by historical interpretation of the early 1990s uh, when the Clinton administration pursued an energy tax uh, and I think it was widely believed that the 1994 uh, Republican takeover of Congress was, uh, was you know, in part uh, a reaction to, to this, among other things, but, uh, but the, the energy taxes were a significant factor. And by contrast, the, uh, there were a series of amendments to the Clean Air Act uh, uh, under the first Bush administration that allowed for a kind of cap and trade uh, system that, uh, to deal with the problem of acid rain. And those were seen as, uh, widely seen as being successful. And so I think that this, this historical analogy is now being applied to the current situation where, although many economists think that a tax would be a better solution to the carbon dioxide emissions problem, uh, it's seen as political suicide and so it's sort of dead in the water. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, you are seeing patterns, particularly in the uh, political arena, um, that may persist moving forward or, or not? Uh, well, I think there are, a lot, there are a lot of patterns. And I guess uh, let me just ex uh, extend a little bit some of the ways in which history is, is being used first. I, I wanted to, just, to mention also that I think you could, you could make the argument that, uh, that some of the reasons why climate uh, legislation hasn't moved forward in the United States is that uh, has to do with some of the dominant historical myths. So I think this is another historical, mm -hmm. a role for historians is to address some of these myths. And one of those is the, uh, is the idea that the energy market is a free market uh, and that the dominance of fossil fuels in the economy today is, uh, is, a, re is a result of just free competition among industries and, uh, and, and fuels over the last century. And I think a historical perspective allows us to see that uh, the, role of the role the government played over the last 100 years, whether it was in tax policy or questions over property rights uh, or also regulation, if you think of the role of the Texas Railroad Commission in uh, setting energy, setting oil prices in many ways in the United States. So I think one, one uh, contribution historians can make is, the, is really to explode the idea that there is a free market in energy and to help people to understand 
uh, that energy has always been a social, uh, part of a social process uh, uh, that's politically negotiated. So as you're asking about what some of the political trends are, uh, I think it's important to see that the political trends of the past are likely to continue into the future. And so a few of those uh, important ones, uh, one is that, uh, the, that there are, are, is a set of rules and regulations uh, that gets set for a dominant fuel, of, such as uh, uh, oil, um, and that th those then help that fuel sort of get entrenched into the, uh, the economic landscape. Uh, so examples of that might be, oh, just a small detail of that would be the competition between streetcars and automobiles uh, in the city. Uh, so one, uh, so, so this is an interesting story because streetcars used to be the dominant transportation, but at some point cars became more popular. And, uh, and there was a decision that the streetcars would have to give way to automobiles, uh, and the automobiles could slow down in front of them, and they could kind of clog up the roadway. And then there was also a decision that the streetcars uh, paid taxes, and those taxes would go to the government, which would then go to fund the, the streets, which would then be there to support uh, the automobiles. And so it's a bit of a, maybe a complicated story, but I think the, the main point is that uh, rules and regulations are strongly associated with the dominant fuel and those will change and I think one thing that we can expect to see over the coming uh, generation really is that these rules and regulations will change. Uh, there was a, an article, uh, essay recently, uh, a collection of articles recently in the New York Times that I think was kind of interesting. It was, it was entitled, uh, I think it was a tough week for coal and uh, it contained a series of these kinds of rules and regulations that were being reversed. Uh, whether it was permits for uh, coal-fired power plants or permit, uh, the right to uh, dump certain kinds of mining wastes and all those things. And those are the kinds of, th are, are examples of the kinds of rules and regulations that will change in the future. Okay. Um, let's continue uh, looking at the, the governmental aspect of it. Um, do you think that states and nations can work together to um, create some kind of climate policy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's really uh, one of the most challenging issues mm -hmm. that, that society faces today. I mean, if you think about at the state level of state governments in the United States, uh, it's clear that there, are, there is an ability to, to collaborate. And, in, in, and actually, over the last decade or so, it's really been the states that have been leading the way, mm -hmm. uh, and also the localities. And I think that's one of the political insights that historians can bring to <clears throat> understanding uh, what to expect in the future which is that climate and energy policy are set not only at the national level, <clears throat> but also at the local, state, uh, uh, and then also international level. Mm -hmm. So as to whether they can collaborate, well clearly uh, at the state level you have regional collaboratives around uh, greenhouse gas emission controls right now, uh, in the Northeast for instance, uh, and collaborations over automobile emission standards. At the international level, I think one of the, thing that, one of the lessons that historians have to offer really has to do with how distinctive uh, the uh, climate problem is from other issues that we've faced in the past. And uh, uh, so one example of that, uh, well, it's, it, I guess it's, it's, it's how difficult it is to find an analogy to climate change. I mean, people like to talk about uh, chlorofluorocarbons and the ozone layer mm -hmm. and how the Montreal Protocol solved that right. problem. Uh, but it was really much, a much narrower issue than the climate one, which really uh, addresses economic development, you know, economic uh, development across so the whole society, as opposed to a few chemicals that can be taken out of production by a small number of companies. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we, we have had uh, international agreements on trade, uh, trade organizations, international security agreements, uh, and all of those have involved states uh, you know, making concessions and, and agreements. And, uh, I, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to come to an international agreement. I think the ultimate question is going to be one of uh, implementation in e within each country. And that goes, returns to my previous uh, comment, which is just that I think it's critical for everyone to understand uh, that the climate problem is one that will be with us for generations as a political problem, that it's not one that will be solved by uh, the passage of a climate bill in, uh, in Congress this session. Uh, but that, that will really just be the beginning of a long period of uh, political conflict over the rules and institutions and implementation of, of those. Okay. So what are some things the government can do to spur an energy transition in the coming years? Well, I think the most important <clears throat> uh, single step the government can take is to, is to find a way to raise the price of, of carbon uh, emissions, carbon dioxide and other related greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, uh, 
there are, that that can be justified and uh, uh, kind of explained by historians if you look by looking at the past and all of the ways that the government uh, has shaped the energy market historically and and really acted to try to drive down fossil fuel uh, prices, whether it's through tax policies or property right property uh, kind of generous property uh, policies. Um, in addition to that, I think that the, the government clearly has a, a historic role uh, that is played in many industries, such as the internet, uh, of public investment, uh, of public investment in science, uh, as well as public subsidies for new technologies, uh, and a role in trying to uh, speed innovation. And I think that uh, uh, if we look uh, historically at a series of different industries, including energy, but also uh, other kinds of scientific breakthroughs, uh, the government has played a, a critical role in that. And I think this goes back to the, the fundamental point that I wanted to make uh, related to the idea of a free market in energy. Mm -hmm. I think that this is one of the real, very problematic myths that has uh, grown up around the, the dominance of, the, of fossil fuels, which is that it was purely about economic, free economic competition that resulted in our, in our embrace of fossil fuels to such an extent. And I think that when you look back at the history, history and this is what my first book was about, is uh, you, know, you see all the different ways that government shaped, shaped the development of the oil economy and really deepened our dependence on, uh, on fossil fuels. And so I think if, if we understand that the market in the past has always been a social market in which politics and uh, kind of social decisions based on our values have shaped that market, then, uh, then we realize that we face those same kinds of social decisions today, and, uh, and that it's not about uh, government intervening in the market, but rather making choices uh, that we all inevitably have to make about what that energy market is gonna look like. Okay, so using history as a guide, eh, what does the future hold for us? Um, are we gonna go the way of the dodo bird, or is there a hope? Mm. Well, that's, that's a little hard to, I mean, I think that the most important thing to, to remember is that, uh, is that the climate change problem, it, it's not really one about human extinction. It's more, it's more a social problem mm -hmm. that, as I was saying about, that uh, relates to our values and the things that we care, and care about and love. Uh, and so they might be things such as peace and security and justice, uh, or even the special places that, that, we, that, that, we, uh, that we care about that are undergoing rapid, rapid change. Uh, so I think really the, the response to climate change, and this again is where historians have something to offer, uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, it's a social and cultural problem as, and political problem as much as a technical one. Uh, so we're not going to go extinct, uh, but we have choices to make as a society about what kind of world we're going to live in in the future. Very good. Thanks very much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure. For more information about Professor Sabin and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.